So, April. Yes, Simon. Did you hear about the Roman legionnaire who went into a bar and held up two fingers? He was ordering five beers. <laughs> It's the Roman for five. Oh, that's so stupid. <laughs> that's a great joke. Oh. Uh, I knew I'd. I knew I had a good joke in there somewhere. Hi everybody and welcome to a brand new episode of Eat My Globe, a podcast about things you didn't know you didn't know about food. And on today's episode we have set ourselves a major, you could say Herculean task, get it? As we're going to attempt to look at what it was like to dine during the period of one of the greatest civilizations of all time. A civilization that, at its peak, lasted for over a thousand years, and a civilization that not only conquered a good chunk of the known world, but also had a unique hierarchy and customs that would define the social status of its inhabitants, and therefore how they ate. However, if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, you will know that I am never afraid of a challenge. And so today, we are going to follow that Latin command to the disciplined legions and cursumina, or attack, Today's episode of Eat My Globe on dining in the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. Well then, where indeed to begin with such a gargantuan task? I think in this case, it is worth beginning at the very start of the history of Rome. Now, of course, there have been hundreds, possibly thousands of books written on this subject, so I don't intend to go into a full history of this civilization, as there are far too many people who can do that far, far better than I can. However, I do think it's a useful starting point. Rome's origins are shrouded in myth, with the belief that the city was founded by Romulus and Remus, the twin sons of the god of war, Mars, and raised by a she-wolf after being abandoned to drown by an enemy king. From there, they grew to avenge themselves on the king and founded their own city. That city was named Rome, after Romulus, who became its first king after he killed his own twin. The city was ruled under a number of subsequent monarchs until 509 BCE, when, after the overthrow of a particular king, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, what a great name, it became a republic, a term that originated from the Latin word res publica, or property of the people. By the way, do you think I should change my name to Simon Ninius Majum Darius Superbus? Because my wife always says, I'm superb. Oh, I think she put that in there. <laughs> anyway, Rome remained a republic for the next 450 years until the fateful day when triumphant warrior and savvy politician Julius Caesar emerged successfully from a civil war in 45 BCE and was declared dictator for life. That's what I should be called, dictator for life. This ushered in the beginning of the Roman Empire, which began brightly under Augustus, who took the name Caesar. Many Roman emperors and their successors later adopted the name Caesar, which became synonymous with the phrase, quote, Prince of Blood, end quote. The Western Roman Empire collapsed in 476 BCE, which is really the end point for the purposes of this episode. During this period, Rome grew from a small city built on seven hills adjacent to the Tiber River to become one of the greatest civilizations in human history, and a civilization that not only had dominance over the known world during its day, but had a lasting impact on the world today and particularly on the European world where its languages and culture linger from the period of its occupation. Although this is admittedly a frighteningly potted history of Rome, it does, as I say, give us a starting point. Many cultures and ingredients influence the ancient Roman table. This included some of the Romans' relationships with its near neighbours, such as the Etruscans and the ancient Greeks, who had a profound impact on Roman culture and consequently influenced not only the food they grew, 
but also how Romans ate across their social strata. It also included other cultures who came under Roman expansion. The Etruscans, an early civilization that preceded Rome and which lasted from around 800 BCE to 200 BCE, provided some of Rome's earliest monarchs. Many scholars recognized the Etruscans as having a huge influence on the earliest development of Rome. In fact, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, quote, the Etruscans formed the most powerful nation in pre-Roman Italy. They created the first great civilization on the peninsula, whose influence on the Romans as well as on present-day culture is increasingly recognized. Evidence suggests that it was the Etruscans who taught the Romans the alphabet and numerals, along with many elements of architecture, art, religion, and dress, end quote. The Etruscans were noted for their love of food, and particularly banqueting, an event that in their culture signified pleasure, as well as the equal status of Etruscan women who attended these banquets while their contemporaries in ancient Greece could not. In these banquets, Etruscans shared a meal during which they reclined on one-armed couches while eating food laid before them by slaves. They also enjoyed drinking parties where they would sit on mats on the floor where they consumed wine. The land of the Etruscans, now the area of Tuscany and parts of Lazio and Umbria in Italy, were extremely fertile, and they were also proficient traders who were able to bring ingredients from all of their neighbouring cultures. In an article on the Ancient History Encyclopedia, the author Mark Cartwright says, quote, Consequently, for those who could afford such things, the banquet tables would have been piled high with all manner of exotic foodstuffs, alongside homegrown staples. Meat included beef, lamb, pork, deer, boar, hare and game birds. There was fish, especially tuna, and seafood aplenty. Enormous rounds of sheep's cheese, olives, porridge, bread pancakes, vegetables, fruit, eggs, raisins and nuts. Flavours were enhanced by the addition of herbs, mint, honey, vinegar, pepper and other spices. The Etruscans were great exporters of wine too, so there would have been no shortage in that department either. End quote. Some of their Mediterranean neighbours disapproved of the indulgences of the Etruscans. Ancient Greek historian Diodorus Siculus says of the Etruscans, quote, as they inhabit a land fertile in fruits of all kinds and cultivate it assiduously, they enjoy an abundance of agricultural produce, which not only is sufficient for themselves, but by its excess leads them to unbridled luxury and indolence. For twice a day they have tables sumptuously dressed and laid with everything that can contribute towards delicate living. They have coverings embroidered with flowers and are served wine in quantities of silver bowls, and they have at their call a considerable number of slaves. End quote. As well as the Etruscans, the ancient Greeks also had a profound impact on Rome, but not just at its beginnings, but through its history. The ancient Greeks influenced how Romans created buildings, created art and literature, informed how they were educated, and influenced not only what they ate in terms of ingredients, but also how they prepared the food. It is also likely that the ancient Romans learnt the practice of serving desserts from the ancient Greeks. Thank you, ancient Greeks. So that's a good beginning point, I think, at which to dive into how and what people ate in ancient Rome, and how we go about searching for that information. What we know about how the Romans ate comes from a number of different sources. The primary one, I would argue, is archaeology. This would be the search of sites of Roman antiquity that could offer up finds of such things like equipment, art, food residue and human waste for study. A major example being at the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum, where complete sewers were preserved after the destruction of the cities by the violent eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 CE. These remains were full of evidence of what was eaten and discarded. As well as archaeology, there would also be Latin text, both contemporary or of a later date, which specialised on history, agriculture and food. The major work, 
Dure Cochinaria, attributed to Marcus Gavius Apicius, and contains around 500 recipes, is one of them. Plus, there would be contemporary letters and theatrical satires of the day, such as in Petronius Sena Trimalcionis, or Trimalcio's Dinner, where he portrays a lavish banquet that may be an exaggeration, but still allows us to get an insight on the basics of an ancient Roman meal. And as well as all these sources, we could also look to works of art, such as paintings, for a view. What these many sources tell us is that meals the Romans ate changed during history. It also gives us great evidence to what ingredients were going to be on the menu for a Roman daily diet. These ingredients included cereals, primarily barley and wheat, but also oats, rye and millet. As we shall see later, these were eaten in the form of porridge, or even more importantly, baked into bread. Olives? were found everywhere, prepared as both fruits and oils. Fruits were plentiful and they were served both fresh and dried. These included apples, figs, grapes, pears, dates, cherries and peaches. The ancient Romans also ate carob, which is part of the pea family and that we now know today as a substitute for chocolate. It's rather nasty stuff if I'm allowed to add a comment. There were also huge numbers of different vegetables, such as asparagus, turnips and cabbages, which the ancient Greeks considered good for those ailing from a hangover, I am told. Artichokes, onions, leeks and cucumbers, as well as legumes such as peas and beans. But it is, of course, worth noting, at this point, although garlic nowadays considered to be so much part of Italian cuisine, may have been mentioned in Apicius Dore Cochinaria due to its availability via trade, it was then used sparingly by the ancient Romans. And of course, the tomato, now ubiquitous in Italian cuisine, originated in Mesoamerica and did not become popular in Europe until the late 19th century. Cheese, or caseus, was not only ready available in Rome, but was a dish considered of high value, particularly those that were imported from abroad. I talk about this in more depth in the Eat My Globe episode on the history of cheese in season two, so go and check it out if you have not yet listened to it. But by the time of the Roman period, cheese making was already a relatively mature form of food production. In his work, Dure Rustica, or On Agriculture, Lucius Junius Moderatus Columella, gives not only a wide-ranging overview of how to raise animals, another great tool in understanding how Romans farmed the food they needed to feed the population, but in Book 7, Section 8, he tells us the best methods of making cheese, methods that are very similar to those that are in place today. Likewise, in his work, Natural History, Pliny the Elder gives his opinion as to which cheeses are, quote, most esteemed at Rome, where the various good things of all nations are to be judged of by comparison. End quote. The list includes cheeses from around what is now Italy, but had particular reverence for cheeses from what is now France. Things don't change much, do they? As for meats, these were expensive and tended to be cured, smoked, pickled, preserved, made into sausages, or used sparingly. They also tended to be of the game variety, like boar, deer and rabbit. The farmed meats were available and included pork, goat and mutton. Beef was available, but as Harold Weston Johnson puts it in his book, The Private Life of the Romans, quote, Beef had been eaten by the Romans since the earliest times, but its use was a mark of luxury until very late in the empire. Under the Republic, the ordinary citizen ate beef only on great occasions when he had offered a steer or cow to the gods in sacrifice. End quote. The ancient Romans also loved to eat birds, such as quail, grouse, duck, woodcocks, chickens, peacocks, thrushes and pheasants, even stretching to birds that we might now not think of as a food source, such as ostrich, blackbirds and flamingos. Other animals that we might consider on the odd side for the dinner table would also include dormice, apparently an ancient Roman favourite, and which Apicius includes in his cookbook for a recipe called stuffed dormice and giraffe. 
As well as being broiled or boiled from fresh, meats were also preserved by salting, drying, smoking and pickling. These preservation methods were also used to satisfy the Romans' particular passion for fish and seafood. As well, of course, of fish being a great source of fresh protein when stocks were available, they were particularly fond of fish such as sardines, which Apicius highlighted with its own section, and anchovies. They also enjoyed seafood and oysters. Clams, mussels and scallops were often found on the dining table of ancient Roman households. In a very different manner, fish too found its way into the majority of Roman food in the form of garum, a fish sauce that was almost ubiquitous in Roman cuisine. This fish sauce could be made with whole small fish layered with salt until it fermented, or a cheaper version which could be made with the entrails of fish. It was also known as liquamen, and the two words were used interchangeably. Although there are some historians who believe that the two were different sources. For a modern day equivalent of how they may have tasted, I would suggest trying either Worcestershire sauce from Great Britain, which contains anchovies, or to the pungent fish sauces so prevalent in many Southeast Asian cuisines. Once produced, the garum could be used on its own to add flavour to dishes, or combined with olive oil, wine, vinegar and herbs to create the dips and sauces that was such a vital part of Roman cuisine. And what about drink? After water and milk, all ancient Romans favoured wine above all other beverages. And the Romans already had classifications for wines from many regions of Italy and across the Roman Empire. Although, it should be noted that the wine they drank was nearly always considerably diluted with water, and to not do so was considered a sign of barbarism. For those too poor to drink even the most base of wines, there was posca, made with vinegar or wine that had vinegared, that is, spoiled, and then watered down and mixed with herbs and spices. It was a drink popular with the plebeian classes and also with the soldiers of the legion. With hindsight, it was actually a potentially healthy drink filled with vitamin C and antibacterial properties because of the vinegar. And I can hear some of you ask, what about beer? Well, the Romans did brew beer, which they called Cerevisia. However, its popularity lagged far behind that of wine, and beer was often considered a barbarian beverage. Oh, and as an added one of those facts you can bore your friends with at dinner parties that we like to give you here on Eat My Globe, the term barbarian comes from the onomatopoeic ancient Greek word barbaros, which described the unintelligible sound of foreigners, that is, the language of non-Greek speakers. To Greeks, foreigners sounded like they were saying ba 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 ba. It was the Romans, literally barbarians themselves, under the Greek definition of the word, i.e. referring to non-Greek speaking people, who changed its meaning to refer to all those who lack Roman and Greek traditions. There you go. Where, I hear you ask, did the Romans go to buy all of this food? Well, by the late 1st century BCE, over 1 million people lived in the city of Rome, a number of people that was not to be matched again until the city of London reached that point in 1800. Wow. To supply goods, be it food or otherwise, to that many people, Rome developed into a city of retailers. The retailers inevitably tended to be found around temples, bathhouses and the forum. They ranged in size from people who hawked their wares on their persons as they walked around, to stalls with simple tables displaying various items, to sellers at luxury markets known as the Macellum, where items such as a large whole fish could be sold to the wealthy at a great price. The Macellum of Pompeii is an example of the scale and grandeur of these markets. It included paintings that have been argued to have had the purpose of providing guidance on how people should behave properly. If you were one of the lower classes, you would have to fight your way around the busy streets to do your food shopping. However, if you were one of the wealthy of Roman society, you may visit the luxurious Macellum, or you may have vendors of meat, fish and vegetables pay you a visit to your house with their daily offerings, so you didn't even have to go to the markets at all. In the records we have, we find that the ancient Romans generally ate about three meals a day. The first snack of the day, for many, was known as the eantaculum, meaning a bit while fasting. We talked about this first meal of the day on our episode on the history of breakfast cereals, so again, make sure you check that out. As a recap, however, 
Ian Taculum was a lighter meal that was taken early in the day just after the sun had broken and consisted of bread which was dipped in wine. It might also have included some cheese and fruit and maybe some meat. This tended to be a snack eaten by those who were at the beginning of a long day's labour. In the early Republic, the next meal was the Senna. Initially, this was a meal taken at around lunchtime. Over the history of the Republic, this meal moved around from being taken at lunchtime to one that was taken at night. Finally, there was an evening meal known as Vesperna, another light meal taken because the Senna was so early in the day. Vesperna began to disappear from use as Senna moved from its lunchtime slot to become an evening meal. Senna was replaced at the midday meal by another meal known as Prandium. This was another light repast that consisted of bread, fish, eggs, vegetables and maybe even some leftover cold meats from the night before. The transplanted meal and time of Senna became a form of entertaining for the ancient Roman household and its lavishness depended on one's financial means. Towards the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of Rome's imperial phase, Senna had become a lavish three-course meal. It would begin with the gustatio, derived from the Latin word for to taste, from which today we get the word gustation. This would be the equivalent of a Monday appetizer and would include dishes such as olives, eggs or fish, and sometimes even the aforementioned dormice. It would be finished with a glass of mulsum, a Roman wine with water and honey. Following the appetizer, the wealthier Romans would have moved on to mensae primae, or the main course of the meal. It often comprised of more than one dish, or fecula, that ended with the star attraction, the caput senai, the star dish that could be whole roasted pigs, or if the family were particularly wealthy and wanted to show off a bit, dishes such as roasted ostrich or peacocks. The final course, the mensae secundae, would have been the equivalent of our dessert. However, while the Romans knew of cane sugar, they used honey for sweetening, and although they did make butter, it was considered more of a poultice for wounds than it was an ingredient. So their end of meal dishes might have been quite different from what we might eat at the end of a meal. This might include more seafood, fruit platters and nuts, and even a form of cheesecake known as civilum, for which there's a recipe from around 160 BCE contained in the earliest book of Roman prose known as De Agricultura by politician Cato the Elder. Quote, recipe for the civilum. Take half a pound of flour, two and a half pounds of cheese, and mix together as for the libum. Add quarter pound of honey and one egg. Grease an earthenware dish with oil. When you have mixed thoroughly, pour into a dish and cover with a crock. See that you bake the centre thoroughly, for it is deepest there. When it is done, remove the dish, cover with honey, sprinkle with poppy seed, place back under the crock for a while, then remove from the fire. Serve in the dish with a spoon. End quote. Doesn't that sound good? If you try this ancient recipe again, always let me know how it turns out. In any case, eating civilum seems like quite a way to end a meal that would have been more than satisfactory to wealthy Romans, particularly when added to the glasses of wine that would have inevitably passed their lips during the evening. Wealthy hosts and guests at some lavish meals would have dined in a triclinium, or dining room, while reclining on three large couches set at a U-shape around dining tables. The fourth side was left open, which I assume would allow servants access to the tables onto which the food would have been placed. It's a practice which recent studies shows reduces the pressure of overeating on the lower part of the stomach, or the antrum. So hmm, next time I visit my in-laws, who feed me a lot of food, perhaps I should try reclining on a couch. Interestingly enough, although their ancient Greek predecessors also reclined, their meals were exclusively male-only events. However, in ancient Rome, women were also allowed to join the gatherings and enjoy the meal, despite the protestations of some of the older diners. But, if that was the way the rich would eat, what about those classes who were lower down the social class structure? Although, 
there was more sophistication to the class structure than I might have time to discuss here. The Roman system basically was initially divided into the upper class, or the patricians, and the working class, or the plebeians. But by 445 BCE, ancient Rome's social structure became divided into five classes. The patricians, who were the aristocrats that included the senators, the equites, who were the business people who owned horses, the plebeians, who were working-class Roman citizens that included architects, teachers, artists, farmers, and others, the freedmen, who were former slaves and granted citizenship with limited rights and who usually continued to work for their former masters but with pay, and finally, the slaves, who had no legal rights and were entirely dependent upon their masters. Just about every aspect of life was impacted by this class structure, and this can be seen particularly in the way they ate and what they ate. As I mentioned earlier, the poorer Romans would not have had easy access to the ingredients that were available to the more wealthy Romans, and if they did, they would not have been able to afford them. But to prevent them from rioting, the emperors tended to provide them with free grain and food at subsidised prices. Grains or frumentum, a term given to the wide range of grains available, were an essential part of the Roman diet and consisted mainly of barley, oats, rye and wheat. For the poorer classes, this daily meal would have probably taken the form of a porridge and a form of rough bread. The porridge, also known as pulse, would have been made of millet and may have been mixed with a few vegetables. Bread was a staple of Rome, and given that Rome imported most of its grain and was often subject to bad harvests and occasional civil wars, the failure to supply adequate amount of grain and bread was a source of potential civil unrest. Until the 2nd century BCE, the establishment of Rome dealt with such shortages. However, in 123 BCE, Roman tribune Gaius Gracchus established a state-subsidised grain law, known as the Lex Frumentaria, that would supply grain to each Roman citizen, such as the plebeians, at a reduced price. Later, in 58 BCE, Tribune Claudius made the allotment free, thereby giving every Roman citizen the right to receive grain. This form of government bribery became a popular mainstay that by 100 CE, was being satirised by writers such as Juvenal, who in his work Satire, Book 10, declared it as, quote, panem et circenses, end quote, or as we might know it today, bread and circuses. That is the notion that in order to keep the general populace in order and to prevent them from rioting, all one needed to do is to make sure that they do not go hungry with the provision of free grain and that they are entertained with the provision of free entertainment like chariot races and gladiators. It's also worth noting that while lower class Romans might purchase food that they could prepare in their dwelling, many did not have the space for cooking facilities. This lack of cooking facilities saw the development of what are considered to be the first of what might be called thermopalia, or what we would consider fast food establishments, to feed Romans with food that could be eaten on the run. At the Thermopolia, L-shaped counters would be set up containing deep stone bowls, or dolia, which contained the dishes of the day. These included cheese baked with honey, mulled wine, lentils, nuts, salty fish and breads. Some of these restaurants did have small seating areas, but traditionally the food was eaten at the counter or on the go. The closest equivalent today might be your traditional Spanish tapas bar. It sounds like it could have been a fun tapas bar, except for the part where they were known for attracting a very rough crowd. I think there are some other elements of Roman society that are definitely worthy of examination too. The legendary Roman army underwent several developments before it became the well-drilled killing machine we all might be familiar with from movies such as Gladiator. Initially, during the Roman Republic, it would have operated as a militia, where Roman citizens were expected to leave their homes and fight when called upon to protect Rome. When it became an empire, service became voluntary, and their terms of service required a minimum of 20 years. When Emperor Augustus came to power, depending on the source we look at, the Roman army consisted of about 28 to 60 legions, 
or about 134,400 men to about 288,000 men. They would likely have been stationed in Roman territories and were either off fighting, training, building infrastructures and engaging in other military activities. To keep these legions fed would have been an immense task, both in terms of growing the food and its distribution to the soldiers and camps. It was the Roman success at these logistics that was a key part of their military dominance for hundreds of years. The development of roads and the building of bridges was a vital part of this strategy. Plus, the unrivaled building of naval supply vessels was also essential in getting food military ration campaigns in far-flung places. For the supply of armies in the field, Rome was the first to develop the notion of soldiers carrying packs of rations, or impedimenta. The impedimenta would have included a hard-tack biscuit called bucellatum. The Roman soldiers would also have received supplies from the home front, called the comiatus. The Roman soldiers' rations were split into two distinct parts. The fruentum, the word that we've seen before referring to their rations of grain, and the sibaria, which covered meat and all other rations. Having meat in their rations meant that the soldiers ate well compared to the lower classes of Rome who could barely afford it. Indeed, the Roman soldiers ate the equivalent of around 3,000 calories per person per day. Primarily, this would have been in the forms of grain such as wheat, barley, oats, spelt and rye. And recent archaeological analysis of bones excavated at British and German military sites suggests that they ate far more meat than their civilian cousins. While some of the meats we might expect to be on there, such as venison, pork, mutton and hare, there were also some others on there that suggest that they killed and ate what they could find as they marched, such as beavers, badgers, foxes, wolves and voles. Nice! At these sites, they also found broken beef bones, indicating removal of marrow bones for soup, and also portable cheese-making kits, all of which goes to indicate that while the food of Roman soldiers was meant primarily to fuel their bodies rather than to provide culinary delight, it still made sure they were fed enough and fed regularly. The slaves of Rome, by contrast, did not fare quite so well. The numbers of slaves in Rome and its territories varied, but it was essential to the economic system of ancient Rome. And in the cities itself, slave numbers are said to have been about 30% of the entire population. While some of the slaves in wealthier homes and in higher ranking positions would have fared better, much of the slaves' diet would have been similar to the poorest Romans, and enough to keep them functioning, if little else. This would include grain, olives that had fallen from the trees, and maybe some salt fish. Some slaves, however, fared better, and these were the gladiators. The movie Gladiator gave us a very definite perception of these slaves, and others who battled often to the death to entertain Romans on days of feasts and circuses. In reality, the gladiators drew their ranks from slaves, condemned offenders, captured prisoners of war, and some volunteers who wanted fame and glory. They were highly prized, and given access to great medical care and plentiful food. Moreover, far from the tall, oiled men rippling with muscles that we have come to expect from movie depictions, their upper bodies were in fact covered in a layer of subcutaneous fat. This was a result of the fact that their diet was one that was very heavy in carbohydrates and very low in animal proteins. We know this because a study by academics from the Medical University of Vienna, Austria, and the University of Bern, Switzerland. They studied a find of bones from a burial place for, shall we say, the losers in gladiatorial battles, located in what is now Ephesus in Turkey. It contained the remnants of over 60 gladiators. What the academics found was fascinating. The diet the bones revealed was not only carb-heavy, primarily from legumes, but almost entirely meat-free. In Book 18... Chapter 14 of his work called Natural History, Pliny the Elder refers to gladiators as hordiari, which roughly translates as barley men. Also, the level of strontium and calcium within the bones showed that the gladiators also drank a tonic made from plant ash, which was believed to keep their bones strong and to help them recover from their training and, of course, their fights. 
This low-protein, high-carb diet was no accident, the extra fat being a desirable quality to protect the nerve endings of the body and to allow the gladiators to continue battling despite cuts to the flesh. It's estimated that the average gladiator had a 1 in 9 chance of surviving every time they went out to fight. Not odds that I would have liked, but at least before they would have been well fed. Now, while I might not have made a very good gladiator, I'm a decent cook. So this seems like a perfect point to go and grab my copy of Marcus Gavius Apicius's book Dure Coconaria and go and make something distinctly Roman. As I'm sure one Roman must have said at one point, Veni, Vidi, Edi. I came, I saw, I ate. See you next week, folks. Do make sure to check out the website associated with this podcast at www.eatmyglobe.com where we will be posting the transcripts from each episode along with all the references and resources we used putting the episodes together in case you want to delve deeper into each subject. There is also a contact button, so please do let us know if there are any subjects that you would like us to cover. And if you like what you hear, please don't forget to subscribe, recommend us to your family and friends, and give us a good rating on your favourite podcast provider. Thank you and goodbye from me, Simon Majunda. We'll speak to you soon on the next episode of Eat My Globe. Things you didn't know, you didn't know about food. The Eat My Globe podcast is a production of It's Not Much But It's Ours and Producer Girl Productions <laughs> and is created with the kind cooperation of the UCLA Department of History. We would especially like to thank Professor Carla Pastana, the Department Chair of the Department of History, and Dr. Tawny Paul, Public History Initiative Director, for their notes on this episode. Also, a huge thank you to Sybil Villanueva for her help with the research and the preparations of the transcripts for this episode, which can be found on the website.